All right. Well, it's 11 o'clock here on my clock. Um, so aloha and welcome to today's presentation hosted by the Pacific and Asian Affairs Council, the United States Institute of Peace, and the World Affairs Councils of America. My name is Nikki Shishido. I'm the Executive Director at the Pacific and Asian Affairs Council, or PAC, and we're located here in beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii. Greetings to everyone joining us from all parts of Hawaii, the US mainland, and the world. I wanna begin by first thanking our co-sponsors who have helped to bring this presentation to you today. They are Seeds of Peace, the East West Center Arts Program, the Spark M. Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution at the College of Social Sciences, University of Hawaii at Manoa, and the Pacific Forum. Next, we have to give a big mahalo to our distinguished speakers. Two amazing ladies from the USIP team joining us from Washington, DC. They are Ms. Allison Sturma, Program Officer for Public Education and National Outreach, and Ms. Elizabeth Murray, Senior Program Officer in the Africa Program. And finally, thank you for joining us. We have a great mixed group of participants today from all across the globe. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and look forward to hearing your questions and comments later in the show. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Pacific and Asian Affairs Council, we are an independent nonprofit organization that serves as the World Affairs Council of Hawaii. We have served over 100,000 high school students, Hawaii high school students, through our global education programs. Uh, PAC promotes understanding and empowers engagement on global and international affairs through high school conferences, classes, teacher workshops, study tours, and more. We also serve as the Hawaii coordinator of the U.S. Department of State's International Visitor Leadership Program, connecting participants from around the world with their local counterparts for professional discussion and exchange. If you'd like to learn more about PAC, please visit www.pachawaii.org. All right, now I just want to quickly run through today's agenda. First, we'll hear from Allison Sturma with remarks about USIP and its connection to Hawaii, followed by the keynote presentation by Ms. Elizabeth Murray, How Art Can Propel Peace, Examples from Africa, I'll then have a couple of questions for Elizabeth, and then we'll follow it up by quick uh, Q&A from the audience. So we really encourage you to ask questions. So please drop them into the chat box and you can do that anytime during today's presentation or during the audience Q&A section. And this uh, presentation will be recorded and also will be available on PAC's YouTube channel for future reference. And now I would like to welcome Ms. Allison Sturma to kick off today's presentation, starting with a brief introduction of herself. So welcome, Allison. Thank you, Nikki. I would love to thank the Pacific and Asian Affairs Council and you and Anna specifically for putting together this program. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually for what should be a fascinating conversation. Uh, as Nikki said, my name is Allison Sturma, and I'm on the Public Education and National Outreach Team at the United States Institute of Peace, or USIP. I have the pleasure of working with community groups like PAC across the country who are interested in learning more about USIP and the pressing international issues that our work addresses. Before turning over to my colleague Elizabeth Murray, I want to provide a brief introduction to, the, to USIP for those who might not know us as well, especially the strong ties that we have to Hawaii. And I'm going to start with a little bit of history. So the USIP Act was signed into law in 1984 by President Ronald Reagan. It established the Institute as an independent nonprofit national institute to serve the American people and the federal government to promote international peace and the resolution of conflicts among the nations and peoples of the world without recourse to violence. 
This act was a result of two decades of work inside and outside of Congress. Inside Congress in the 1960s, Congressman and then Senator Sparks Matsunaga of Hawaii was instrumental in this work. Senator Matsunaga, as you may know, was a World War II veteran, twice wounded and decorated as a member of the US Army's 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. He, like other veterans from both political parties, had been deeply affected by his experience during the war and brought that perspective with him to Capitol Hill. Senator Matsunaga believed that international peace was America's most pressing national priority and urged the creation of an institution that would treat seriously the study and practice of peace, drawing parallels with the nation's four military service academies. In the 1970s, the efforts of Senator Matsunaga and others in Congress were spurred on by a grassroots movement, tens of thousands strong all across the US, everyday Americans pushing for change. It was later Senator Matsunaga that President Carter charged with leading the US, US Senate funded Commission on Proposals for the National Academy of Peace and Conflict. The commission analyzed more than 100 proposed laws held town halls in 11 communities around the country, including Honolulu, and oversaw congressional hearings, ultimately leading to the passage of a law to create the United States Institute of Peace. Throughout the years, the Institute, which is funded by Congress, has enjoyed strong support from the Hawaiian congressional delegation, including Senators Daniel Akaka and Daniel Inouye. Senator Inouye's continued to support, including working across the political aisle, is recognized at our headquarters campus in Washington, DC. The photo I'm currently using as a background shows the Stevens Inouye Courtyard, named in honor of the Senator and his colleague, Ted Stevens, a Republican from Alaska. Speaking at an event on Capitol Hill in honor of USIP's 20th anniversary, Senator Inouye called USIP's work vital. And 37 years after Senator Matsunaga joined President Reagan at the signing of the USIP Act, our vital work continues. Dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible, practical, and essential for US and global security. The Institute pursues its mission by linking research and policy and training and analysis and direct action to support those working to build a more peaceful and inclusive world. This means that we serve as a nonpartisan government partner and trusted intermediary among foreign governments, civil society, and US government officials. We work directly in conflict zones at the community level and with national and regional governments with a focus on connecting top-down and bottom-up initiatives. We apply research through training and education, policy recommendations, and the sharing of best practices. And we also partner with stakeholders around the world to research, support, and advance strategies to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict. Before I turn it back to Nikki, I encourage you to stay engaged with USIP beyond this conversation. Because while USIP's mission is directed at preventing and resolving violent conflict overseas per the mandate we are given by Congress, there's another important part of that mandate that calls on us to serve the American people directly by providing education and information on how conflicts can be resolved without violence and how peace is possible. Events like this are one part of that work, but we also work closely with K-12 educators, we support student contests, and we provide grants among other programs. We've had the privilege of welcoming several schools representing Hawaii as part of the Academic World Quest competition to our headquarters in Washington, DC, and have also provided grants to several Hawaiian organizations. And lastly, we've also always had strong Hawaiian participation in the annual Peace Day Challenge held in honor of the International Day of Peace each September. For those of you interested in following our work more closely after today, I encourage you to follow us on social media, sign up for our email newsletter, and tune into webcasts and virtual events, or reach out to me directly. I will be adding my contact information to the chat. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Nikki. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allison. I love it. Peace is possible. Yes. And 
you know, Hawaii people love to hear these connections. It's so great. I was really moved to hear the story behind the Hawaii USIP connection. And really glad that we're getting to work together on this project today. So thank you and your whole team. And now I would like to welcome Ms. Elizabeth Murray for today's keynote presentation. Elizabeth, uh, if you wouldn't mind giving a brief introduction of yourself before you begin. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and thanks so much to you and Anna and the entire Pacific and Asian Affairs Council for hosting me today. It's great to be with you all. And thanks to all the participants who joined too. I, I'm so impressed by, by your background and I really look forward to our engagement during the Q&A portion of the event. My name is Elizabeth Murray, as you know, and I'm a senior program officer at USIP. At USIP, my work focuses on Sudan, Central African Republic and the Sahel region of Africa. But I've been with USIP for 12 years, so I've had the great fortune of working on a variety of projects in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I'm focused now, and also in Latin America um, at the beginning of my career at USIP. Today, I'm going to be speaking with you on the role of arts in peace in Sudan and Central African Republic. And the two examples that I'm going to share with you today are very different from one another. So I hope that they can help us to think broadly about the role of arts in peace and that we can then have a rich conversation during the Q&A. In Sudan, arts played a role in fueling a nonviolent revolution that culminated in the overthrow of longtime dictator Omar al-Bashir. So this is an example of how arts can contribute to change at the national level. In the Central African Republic, which I will refer to by its abbreviation CAR, I'm going to be sharing about how USIP incorporated arts into its dialogue program in four communities. While the Sudan case is about how arts can fuel change at the national level, the CAR case is more about how arts can be used in local level peace building. So let's begin with Sudan. To give a little bit of context, Sudan is a large country in Northeastern Africa a population of 42 million. The capital city is fairly cosmopolitan, the capital city of Khartoum, I should say, uh, with several strong universities and, and a solid private sector. At the same time, many of Sudan's citizens live in poverty, and this is particularly acute outside of the capital region. Sudan also have, has a history of government repression and state-sponsored violence against its citizens. It was ruled by dictator Omar al-Bashir for nearly 30 years. He came to power in 1989 and Bashir used repression to keep his political opponents at bay. Under his rule, the government would routinely detain, arrest and even torture activists and political opposition figures. And the Bashir regime also waged war against people in the peripheral or outlying regions of the country. Um, the regime was, was responsible for much of the violence that killed more than 200,000 people in, in Darfur in the early 2000s. And Bashir's government was notoriously corrupt. So during his rule, the government's resources were used to enrich a, a very small group of people, um, mostly those that were close to the president um, from the Nile River Valley in the center of the country. Um, but this enriching of a select set of people, um, the elite from the, the Nile River Basin, um, came at the expense of the de development of the rest of the country, which fueled a lot of grievances, as you could imagine. So over the course of Bashir's rule, there were many grievances, as, as I've articulated, and there had been several rounds of protests, but these never really took off because the government uh, was so skilled at repression that they would quickly crack down um, and end the protests. But in late 2018, things were different. The protests did take off. They were, they were much better organized and they got too big and too strong for the government to easily repress. Protests began in the northern city of Atbara over high prices and other economic problems. And people were protesting living conditions, but at the same time, it was a protest against the government that people felt was responsible for these conditions. So the, the nonviolent movement gathered momentum, spread across the country with a variety of tactics, sit-ins, marches, boycotts, and other forms of protest. And the most famous of these, and, and the one that you may have seen um, in, in news coverage or, or your research about Sudan, was the massive sit-in at the military headquarters in the capital city of Khartoum. Tens of thousands of people um, sat 
in, in this square in front of the military headquarters 24 hours a day for weeks on end. And it was, I think, a really, really powerful symbol of, of these scores of people protesting peacefully um, in front of the building that housed one of the main arms of repression of the government that had been used to commit violence against citizens. And after, after a short time, the protests had evolved from, as I explained, they, they were originally about economic conditions, but they evolved into an explicit demand for the removal of Omar al-Bashir. The protests were organized by a group called the Sudanese Professionals Association. And I think it's, it's important to note that traditional political parties are not very well regarded in Sudan. So they hadn't been able to organize protests very effectively in the past because people just didn't really trust the political parties. But in contrast, the Sudanese Professionals Association, which is a grouping of the Doctors Association and the Lawyers Association and the Teachers Association and other, other groups of, of different professions, they were really able to garner people's trust um, and bring a large cross-section of people to the demonstrations, um, which is critical for the success of, of any nonviolent movement, as, as you know. So what role did art play? As the protests ramped up around the country, you saw an absolute explosion of art and creativity, song, graffiti, poetry, dance, virtual art, you name it. And this was really drawing on Sudan's rich arts tradition. So Sudan is, um, Sudanese art is a mix of Arab and African styles and it's, it's very unique. And Sudan is also, the birthplace of what is known as the cartoon school. Some of the artists on, on the call, I'm sure you, you know this. Um, the cartoon school is a modernist art movement that, that was founded in Sudan and, and is actually one of Africa's most famous art movements. But in spite of this rich tradition, artists had been repressed over many years and political art had been particularly discouraged. And, and so as a consequence of this repression uh, and, and, and the terrible economy, it was, it was really hard to make a living as an artist in Sudan. And the art scene was, was sort, of, sort of weak and, and underground for, for a number of years. But this really started to change in, in 2019 because as the protests um, that I just described as they grew, this started to open up space for artists who had long been repressed to go public with their work. And I sometimes explain this as, is, is sort of a virtuous cycle. So because the protests were growing and getting stronger, the government was, was sort of losing its, its ability to, to repress. It was, it was losing it, its grip on repression. And so the space was cracked open slightly for free expression. And then at the same time, when the artists were able to begin to, to create, um, to, 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 to do art, to do poetry, to do song in the space, that sort of helped to further pry open um, the space for more free expression. And so it went until you just had um, a massive amount of art that was part of the revolution and, and a much broader acceptance of, of the role of art in public life. And there were so many different mediums of art that were part of the revolution. Some of the most famous art um, was graffiti. And this was graffiti that was graffiti or murals, however, um, however you, you want to call it. And this was not just used to call out the, the Bashir regime um, for all of its violence, but it was also used to really encapsulate visually what the movement was for. So not just what people were against, but, but what they wanted to see in their future. Um, beyond graffiti art, you had so many, um, so much singing, so many poetry recitations at the sit-in over the many hours and days of protests. Um, you had art on, on canvas. There's a beautiful artwork that was, that was part of a flyer for this movement. Um, that art and many others captured some of the most iconic moments during the revolution. And something that was really innovative during the revolution was the use of virtual art. So art that was created specifically for consumption online. Uh, many people in the Sudanese diaspora um, were not able to come back to the country during the revolution as, as much as they wanted to because travel was difficult or dangerous. And, and some of the artists described to me um, feeling helpless when, when their, their family members and their friends were on the streets 24 hours a day, protesting, facing dangerous conditions. They, they, they really wanted to do something to help. So they, a lot of people um, created art specifically for use on, on Facebook or Instagram to draw attention to what was happening in Sudan, to the demands of the protesters, to some of the repression that they were experiencing. 
And this was particularly, um, particularly useful after a really violent crackdown on the, the protests in, in June of 2019. Uh, members of the diaspora created the, the Blue for Sudan hashtag, encouraging people on Instagram and Facebook to change their profiles blue in support of the Sudanese protesters. Um, and one of, one of the most innovative uh, works of virtual art um, that, I, that I saw um, from Sudan was made by a member of the, di the diaspora, a man named Mergani Sali, who was living in Dubai at the time and wanted to highlight the role of women in the revolution. So in spite of um, women being um, discouraged from playing strong roles in, in public life in many ways during the Bashir regime, women really stepped up and played a tremendous role in, in the revolution. And, and Mergani wanted to honor this. So he created a photo mosaic of an iconic portrait of a traditional Sudanese grandmother. And he says that the, the Sudanese grandmother conveys respect and authority. And so he created a mosaic of this image by using photos of, of women who were leaders in the revolution. And if it's if it's hard to explain, it's because it's, 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 it's extremely complex. So I'd love it if we could um, show the video right now. It's just a two minute video and I think you'd, you'd really enjoy seeing it. So I, I hope that you enjoyed that. I think that um, I think that Morgani is just a, an absolute genius. How he was able to amass that database of, of photographs and then sort of overlay them um, to create this this famous image. Um, there's in the article um, that I wrote for USIP about the role of arts in Sudan. There are a few other videos if you're interested in that sort of um, sort of interactive videos. I, I'd encourage you to, to click through the article and. Um, when I think about what art accomplished in the revolution, I, I think of a few key things. I think that art helped to spur conversations about the trajectory of the country. So well, what, was, what was wrong, um, the abuses, bringing the abuses to light, and what was desired for the future. 
And an example of this is the work of the graffiti artist, Asil Diab, who is known by the artist name Sudalov. Asil Diab um, was a member of the diaspora. I, she was, I think in, um, she was somewhere in the Gulf at the time. Or, and she returned um, to Sudan during the revolution and she started a massive public art project of creating murals to memorialize what are known as the martyrs of the revolution. So those protesters that were killed by security services and also people who had been killed by the previous regime. So a seal would go to the homes of, of the people who had been killed, the martyrs, and, and talk to their families and make sure that they were okay, or that they wanted a mural of their loved ones outside of their gates on, on the, the walls that often border um, between the homes and the street in, in Khartoum. And um, people were, were really enthusiastic about memorializing their loved ones in these ways. And Asil would invite, she's, she's the artist, but she would invite the participation of the family members to help her paint, um, to help her draw outlines, to help her make sure she depicted the, the, the faces of their loved ones in the right way. And, and so I think that that was, um, she has described to me that that was a really, a really healing experience for, for the, the people who were grieving, who were able to participate with her. And, the work, the artwork was so large. So these would be six or seven foot tall portraits, just um, uh, facial portraits of people. So she has said to me that when you know when you walk out onto the street and you see these the sort of massive faces of people who were killed during the revolution, she said, you know, whether you're for or against the revolution, you're forced to be reminded of what's going on and, and to think about it and to sort of decide what your position is on, on what's going on. So it was a way of really forcing people to think and engage with what was happening around them. I also think that that the public art can be a call to action. So some of the most popular slogans of the revolution um, were, were painted in, in graffiti around the sit-in and elsewhere in Sudan. And I help, think that helped to mobilize people around key goals and messages. And then, and then for the, the, you know, the song and the, and the poetry and the chanting at the sit-in, I think this, this really helped to fortify people after long days of protests when they were facing incredible danger. Um, this helped people you know, face their fears and, and gather strength for more and more days of protests. And then the last thing that I'll mention is that art actually had a really, a really practical role in the revolution because when the internet was shut down as the government did at several points during the revolution, artists would go out, paint simple murals and actually put the time and date of the next protest as part of the mural. So it was a way to convey to people that, you know, please show up at, at this corner at this time on this day when it was quite literally impossible um, to communicate with people in, in other ways. Like, through um, Facebook or WhatsApp or, or all the other tools that are usually used to, to organize protests. So that's a bit about the role of art. And maybe you're wondering how, how did this end? What happened in Sudan? Omar al-Bashir was removed in April, 2019, but he was replaced by a military junta. So for the protesters, this, this was not enough. This wasn't what they wanted. They were looking for a transition to civilian rule and they decided to keep the pressure on under the leadership of, of the Sudanese Professionals Association um, and, and a coalition of other organizations known as the Forces for Freedom and Change. So they kept up the sit-in asking for a transition to civilian rule, um, but there was a, a very, as I mentioned, a very violent crackdown on the sit-in in, in June, 2019 um, that was carried out by people who were loyal to the previous regime. Um, and this resulted in, in the terrible deaths of, of more than 100 protesters. Um, after that, um, the, the Forces for Freedom and Change, the Sudanese Professionals Association, they shifted to some different tactics, in, including boycotts, um, but they did manage to keep the pressure on. And in August 2019, there was finally an agreement that set out um, a 39-month period of power sharing um, during which um, uh, the power would be the government would be jointly managed by the military and civilians, and this was the transition period to full civilian rule. So the revolution had succeeded in its goals. Um, it, it's been hailed by a senior UN official as one of the greatest nonviolent movements of our time, um, and it is absolutely something to celebrate, and, um, and the role of art is something to celebrate as well. At the same time, Sudan's still in a precarious position. It's, it's early in its transition and there are many challenges. And, and I think there's still a role for art at this time, um, which we can discuss more in the Q&A if you're interested. So 
having given you a snapshot of the role that art can play in a national level movement, I now wanted to discuss USIP's programming in, in Central African Republic um, as an example of how art can be used in, in a community setting. Um, so let me give some, some brief background on the Central African Republic, which again, I'll refer to by its acronym CAR in, in this presentation. So CAR is, is a much smaller country than Sudan. It actually, they share, um, they share a short border, um, but the population is only about 5 million. And at this time, a full one third of the population is displaced by conflict. Um, people are either displaced internally um, to other cities within CAR or displaced um, their refugees in neighboring countries. So that's, I mean, a pretty stark statistic um, explaining how, how, how complex and how protracted the conflict has been there. CAR is extremely underdeveloped um, with the vast majority of the population living in poverty, very few jobs and opportunities um, and a very, very weak um, private sector and a government that is sort of barely able to or, or not even in some cases able to, to meet the needs of the citizens across the country. CARS experienced numerous violent conflicts since its independence in 1960. And the conflict that is ongoing today is a continuation of the conflict that, that started in 2012. Um, in 2012, a new rebel coalition formed. They were aggrieved by underdevelopment in the outlying regions, uh, particularly the North, and the fact that the government hadn't implemented a, a previous peace agreement. The conflict wasn't religious at the outset. Um, it was about lack of opportunity. It was about inequality. It was about underdevelopment. But it took on a religious dimension. The, the rebel coalition from the north was primarily, uh, but not entirely, Muslim. And you saw a real hardening of identities on religious lines. There were a number of atrocities committed against both Muslims and Christians. Um, but Muslims are, were very much a minority in CAR and were in much um, greater danger. And in fact, many Muslims either fled or were evacuated from the country um, under the risk of ethnic cleansing. So I, I wish I could tell you that things were, were a lot better in, in CAR today. There have been several peace agreements over the years um, since this conflict began. I think eight peace agreements in seven years, to be precise. But none of them has, has really succeeded in transforming the conflict. When we began our work in CAR in 2016, um, there had been a successful transition to an elected president, but the country was still and is still in, in a very unstable place. At the outset of our work, we felt that one of the underlying issues in CAR was the lack of inclusive governance. So there is a long history of the political elite in Bangui, the capital, not consulting with citizens. So, the political elite just going ahead and, and making decisions for the rest of the country without taking the time to fully understand what, citizen, what citizens wanted or what they were facing or what their concerns were. So our program um, was aimed to improve communication between citizens and the policymakers in Bangui. And we began by working with the national policymakers to help them develop ways to consult with citizens. And at the same time, um, USIP together with its partners initiated community dialogues in four communities on the issues of security. So what were the security concerns um, for people and, and how did they want them to be managed? And also on the issue of demobilization, disarmament and reintegration, sometimes known by its acronym DDR, um, which is that, sorry, the demobilization, disarmament and reintegration of former combatants that's known as DDR. And that's historically been a really thorny issue um, because it's, it's very hard to figure out how you get people out of armed groups and back into their communities as, as functional members of society. So the idea we have these the work with the national level policymakers um, and, and, and work with four communities. And the idea was then to bring the two parts of the program together. We would develop the dialogues in the four communities and then the policymakers in Bangui would go out um, and participate in or observe these dialogues and thus improve their understanding of the real issues that people were grappling with at the community level. And the hope was that this would lead to the creation of, of more responsive policy. So to initiate the dialogues in the community, I've been awarding, okay, thank you. To initiate the, the dialogues in the community, we used some experimental methods, um, and this was open art spaces. We created um, uh, week-long 
free um, art workshops where people could come and go as they pleased and they could engage in painting, embroidery, poetry, or singing, expressing their views on, on peace and conflict and their hopes for the future. And we brought in local artists from each community um, and, and asked them to lead workshops on their respective craft so that, that people could, could learn a new form of art if they wanted. So these, these, these open spaces um, were one way that we started the community dialogues and the open art spaces. And another way was through participatory filmmaking. So we worked with, with groups of citizens in, in the four communities and did a short course on documentary filmmaking and then asked the, the different groups um, to work as groups, as, as four different groups to distill a key security concern for the community into a short documentary film. And I think this was, this was arts-based peace building in a few ways. After the films were finished, we showed them at a film festival in Bangui to a lot of the Bangui elite who, like I said, historically didn't know very much about what was happening out in the, in the, the far flung regions. So we were getting the views of citizens in front of policymakers, of sort of elevating the voices of, of people who are less heard. And then it was also peace building and that people within the communities who were working together on these documentaries, they didn't always see things in the same way. So they had to really hash things out and agree upon what they thought the main issues were and how they were going to present them in a documentary film. The, this art space methodology was, was really experimental and we, we were sure how it would work, but it was, it was really popular. So hundreds and hundreds of people um, arrived at each of these open art spaces um, to, to create art over, over the, you know, the week or so that each art space was open. And they, they talked about their lived experience of violence, their expectations for peace, what they thought reconciliation would look like. And it was, it was a great entry point to draw people in um, to participate who might have been intimidated otherwise. So it, it brought people in to express themselves and some of them stayed on to participate in more formal dialogue processes. This was particularly the case for, for young people or for people with less formal education um, who were perhaps more comfortable in an open space and that allowed them to sort of ease into a dialogue when they might not have been comfortable with just showing up and starting with a dialogue. When, when I look at this work, I, um, I look back on it and think that there were a number of successes and there were also a few challenges. We, one of the intentions of the open art spaces was to allow people to express themselves, but also to be able to then analyze that, that body of art to see what perspectives and what um, recommendations people were trying to convey. And there is not a really well-established way, at least that, that we know of, if, if somebody knows otherwise, I would love to hear. There's not a really well-established way to sort of analyze art to see what um, to see what the messages that people were trying to convey were. And, and you might say that art is art, it's not meant to be analyzed, but in this case, it was sort of in, intended to be part of a communication tool with the government. So I, I, looking back on it, I wish that we had figured out um, a more systematic way to analyze all the art. And I think the other challenge is that, you know, in, in the field of peace building um, in general, and particularly with these more experimental methodologies, it's, it's really important to work to show impact. Um, what changes did our work lead to at the community level? And we did do that to an extent. We, you know, we, rig we rigorously tracked the impacts of the program, but it's 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 always important to be going back several years later and trying to understand did these impacts last over several years. Um, so I, I want to I want to wrap up here. We can talk more about CAR in the Q and A if you'd like. Unfortunately, there's been a recent worsening of violence there since um, December 2020. Um, but you know, just a few final thoughts. I wanted to share that my former colleague, Maria Stefan, who's an expert in nonviolent movements, told me once that art has been a significant part of all major nonviolent movements. And she considers that it's an expression of shared, hum shared humanity that tends to unite people. And she shared this observation with me when we were talking about how arts can draw people to nonviolent struggle. Um, but I think the observation applies to peace building at the community level at well, or as well, or even international peace negotiations. I think that there is a unifying quality to art that is that is hard to quantify, but, but that is there. And I think that we're only at the beginning of our understanding of how art can help to further peace. Um, so I hope that we can have a discussion on this. I really look forward to your, your questions and comments on the topic. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I mean, that, thank you for bringing that to life for us. There's just so much background. And so thank you for sharing the background a lot. I don't, for me personally, I, I was not very familiar, but yes, you're right. I mean, the role of art being, you know, such a significant part in all nonviolent movements. I mean, that's really impressive. And I, I totally understand what you're saying that, you know, it's just some unquantifiable mm -hmm. um, feeling that it puts out to not yet the people, everyone that's involved and people watching from near or far. So yes, thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, um, I want to encourage people to yes, put your questions into the chat box. I'm going to be asking Elizabeth a couple of questions. Um, but please, um, if you have something pop up, put it in the chat box and we'll we'll get to that right after this. Um, but you know, Elizabeth, you just did a deep dive on two cases. Um, are there other examples that you can share of where art has been used in peace building or nonviolent movements? Absolutely. So, so many. I see some interesting questions coming up. Um, so, so many. Um, I, I can hardly, you know, I can, you know, I'll just scratch the surface, but Balai Citoyen is a movement in Burkina Faso um, that was started in 2013 by a hip hop artist and a reggae musician. Um, and so they had songs that really railed against the corruption, um, the corruption of, of the government and, and sort of the, the longtime president who had defied international norms and stayed in the office for, for way too long. And, and this, um, the music was really key to mobilizing people to to mass protests that ended up leading to the removal of this president who had stayed for a very long time. So that's one example from Burkina Faso. Um, I love, love, love the work of arch lords in Afghanistan. So this is a play on the term warlords. Um, this is an amazing group um, that has, has worked to transform um, some of the symbols of war, some of the symbols that are associated with conflict into art that promotes peace. And I think I think Allison has this link. She can she can drop it into the chat. But some of my colleagues have worked with um, with the Art Lords organization and supported their work. They've created murals across um, Kabul and other parts of Afghanistan on, on the blast walls. So, you know, there are a lot of blast walls in um, in Kabul and other places um, to protect buildings from from explosions that may occur on the streets. And the, these walls themselves are really traumatic and people see these walls and they know that they're in conflict. So Art Lords has worked to, um, to decorate the blast walls and, and try to, um, to, to make them sort of a forum for peace. And they've also worked to elevate everyday heroes and where there's often a glorification of, of, of warlords in some cultures, Art Lords has worked to, um, to portray as heroes um, the medical workers, the teachers, the peace workers. So I love Art Lords and I'd really recommend it. And I, I recently read the other day, and I, I, I'm just going to drop this into the chat because I just saw this in the New York Times, um, an article about the role of arts in, in, in Myanmar in the protests in Burma right now. And I think that would be, that's really, there's some really fascinating uh, methods that people are using, including projecting images onto buildings, but doing it incognito so the government can't come and find them. Um, so I think there's there's a lot that's going on all the time. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure you all have wonderful examples as well. And I, I'd love to hear them. Yes, no, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I know, great. Thank you. So, the audience is putting in questions, but just one more quick one, because I thought um, this is would be kind of interesting for everyone to hear. but. Um, you know, what advice would you have for someone who is starting a peace building project? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think that it is really important to, um, to work to understand the problem that you're trying to solve, to really talk to people at the community level. So maybe you're part of a community that's affected by some sort of uh, conflict or, or, or certainly or discrimination like we're seeing today. Um, but engaging with the issue from, from sort of all different perspectives um, and getting people who are affected by conflict involved in the planning of your peace building project, I think is, is really important. I feel like at the beginning of a project, it, it's useful to start small because you don't know that you're going to be successful and you're, you'll probably learn a lot from your first go around that you could use to improve your program. So I think starting small makes sense. And I also think, you know, in the peace building field, we we try to always follow what's called a do no harm approach. 
so many times our, the work that we try to do, we being, you know, all the international community, everyone, the work that we try to do to help lift countries out of poverty, um, to help do peace building, to help provide humanitarian relief, there can be unintended harm. So I think it's really important to do sort of a look at the problem and the project from every possible angle and, and make sure that you aren't doing inadvertent harm. Great. No, those are great tips. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I do want to jump into some of these questions. Uh, maybe a couple of this, uh, hopefully an easy one from Sophia first. Um, she's curious why blue was the chosen color to represent that virtual um, art piece in the movie. I saw that and I, I actually do not know. Um, I, I can find out and I will send it back to you. That is a wonderful question. I have, I have no idea. Um, because it is not part of the flag of Sudan. So, so I don't know, but it's a great question. Okay. Um, also, I mean, so Rabiana was wondering, is there a link where they can watch how the films are made? I think the one you're talking about in car. You know, I, there is not, they are, they are not public. Um, I can send, um, I can send to you and you could share with participants. Uh, article about our work but the the films over there are they're too big to be uploaded onto mm -hmm. um and they, they are so they also are not translated into english and unfortunately we, we don't have those okay yeah no worries but if you do have anything we can share that with the audience later yeah, absolutely we do have a question from burns um uh, uh, he's asked could someone please talk about the role of social media if any in how that art is shared with the population, especially in a relatively underdeveloped area or a country like Car. Yeah. yeah. It's a really interesting question because I think there's really, there's really two sides to the coin of social media. Um, in, in a place like Sudan, I think you have, you know, you have better bandwidth and and um, and art can be shared pretty widely. Um, it's it's a little more complicated in in car. Um, where people don't have as reliable cell phone service, um, and so I think that I think that the art that's that's happening in car is often more of a, a lived art tradition. So a lot of song and dance. You had a lot of you have a lot of participatory theater. Um, I saw some people on here are um, are with us from from theater councils. I saw somebody posted an answer to why social media is turning Sudan blue. I, that is wonderful. Thank you for finding that for me. Um, so I think a lot of the art that's happening in, in people's lives is, is through song, um, is through um, participatory theater, um, is through poetry recitations. There aren't as many opportunities to share large pieces of visual art. I think there's also art in what people are wearing um, in in how they're sort of designing their houses in 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 housewares and in, in, in the goods that they're using day to day. But I wouldn't say that social media is being used to share art as much in car. In fact, if I'm being honest with you, I mean social media in in car right now is being used. Um, it, it's causing some great harm because there have been some horrible misinformation and disinformation campaigns. In Central African Republic. And some of these are being run by people inside the country. Some of them are being run by people outside of the country. Um, but it's um, it's really hard to get a straight story in CAR because these agents of misinformation and disinformation that are present around the world are so very active in CAR right now. Um, and it's, it's led to people um, feeling really silenced and threatened. So there are some really great organizations. Internews is one of them that's working on um, training journalists to produce um, reputable stories and counter misinformation and disinformation. Um, all that to say that, um, yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword, social media. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we're seeing it all over the world, but we're just, we're also trying to teach our high school students how to be, you know, have greater media literacy. It's um, really can be a problem, great tool, but also could be a problem. Um, I also, I'm scanning through here. Um, so we have another question about the anti-Asians of violence. So what, in your opinion, Elizabeth, how can art be used to counter the anti-Asian violence? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that there are, um, I think art has a way of really humanizing people. And, you know, on the one hand, when you think of people who are committing violence against Asians, you, you almost feel like 
you don't want to engage with that people that you, you know you, you shouldn't have to no one should have to prove their humanity um but i think that art art can you know to the extent that we're even willing to engage with people who are discriminatory who are racist um i have i think that um that narrative storytelling i've seen um a colleague of mine ha, um it just did um sort of a it was an illustrated cartoon um it was him writing letters to his um his, i think it was his grandfather in in northern korea and it was a, an incredibly moving story um that was told through through letters and in cartoons and and i think that when we allow art to be the vehicle um, through which we tell our stories, it's 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 easier to 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 see our shared humanity um, because sometimes we just people don't respond as well to um, lists of of facts that that of course Asian Americans aren't responsible for whatever ridiculous thing you think that they're responsible for. People respond to stories. People respond to to things that touch them. Um, I I participated in a workshop about a technique that um, called this is a bit of an aside, but it's called um, deep canvassing. And it's been used by um, the group um, showing up for racial justice. And they have shown time and time again that, that telling stories, and I think by extension, art is what transforms people's views. So you can show up with 25 statistics about why you're right on a certain political debate, but people like won't, it's not statistics that change people's minds. It's it's art and it's it's storytelling. Um, and so they they trained us through through this method to, to try to use our personal stories or engage people in their personal stories as a way to really connect. And it's so counterintuitive because like my instinct is just to argue with people and, and say a lot of statistics, but I think that, that storytelling and, and art can be more powerful. Oh, great. Yeah, I, I can totally see. I mean, you don't want to be hear, like hearing all these lists of things. It's about what moves you and you're right. Stories, really cartoons or images, always very much more moving. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do have another question from Sophia. So she's asking, uh, do you have any volunteer opportunities on the topic of art and peace that might be available for high school students? Gosh, that is a great question. And I, so USIP, we are not, um, we don't have volunteers. We, by the statues that created us, we, we, we can't have volunteers. And it's, it's unfortunate because I had so many wonderful people who I would love um, to have volunteer with me. Um, I, I, so, so the answer is no, but I think that there's a lot that you can do in your high school. Um, I, this is, um, this is a story from way back, but when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Costa Rica, um, some other volunteers and I, together with, with Costa Rican youth that we were working with, we started an Art for Peace Festival, um, which was just um, at the community level. And then we brought a few different communities together to share the different arts and poetry and dance that people had developed to share their experiences of, of peace and conflict. And in Costa Rica, you don't have a lot of organized violence. You have a lot of social conflict. So there's a lot of there's a lot of domestic violence. Um, but it was it was a really it was a really powerful method to get people to share. And I think so. I think in your high school or in your town, you know, an Arts for Peace festival could could be really powerful, and you could reach a lot of people that way. I mean, there's this is an incredible time. This is a difficult time in so many ways um, with the violence against Asian Americans, with the contested election. I mean, there is so much need for work at the community community level. Um, you know, I've seen people who are doing work like I'm doing international, sort of stepping back and saying, okay, it's great to be doing this work internationally, but you know, what am I doing if my own community is on fire? So like, I encourage you to think locally. There's so many wonderful things you can do. You can, I, I drop my, my email in there. You can feel free to email you, me and I can share my experience. Oh, great. No, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions here. So I'm gonna kind of keep blazing through. Um, one from Gilbert, he's asking, you know, when you're talking about car and the films and the art, how did the political elites react and respond to seeing it? And did they yeah. get anything from it message wise? Yeah, that's a great question. It was really powerful. So people at the beginning, we 
Um, a little bit of background on CAR is that in 2015, there was, uh, there was these questions are amazing. People are, I would just love to stay here for hours, um, but I'm gonna close this chat box so I stay focused. Um, in, in CAR in 2015, um, there was a national dialogue called the Bangui Forum. And the Bangui Forum was an opportunity um, for citizens at all, all levels across the country, they were able to express their views through popular consultations. So government representatives went around and really heard from people about their concerns. Um, in all the, the 72 different regions of the country. And then the people, representatives from each locale came together for a national dialogue. And people were incredibly enthusiastic about this opportunity because they hadn't, they had, had barely ever, if at all, been consulted um, over the course of their lives. And there was this real desire on the part of citizens for this to continue. And so we were talking to some members of the government and they said, oh yeah, the Bangui Forum, the popular consultations, you know, we did that and, and that's done. And the sense was that that was sort of that the, the, the activity of consulting citizens had been accomplished and there wasn't as much of an acknowledgement that this needed to consider, it needed to continue. So I think that there people were, were really skeptical. Some, some members of the government were skeptical at the beginning, but we really, really had some believers by the end. You know, I'm, I'm remembering some, some members of this group of, of national level policymakers that we worked with that, you know, came back and they were writing reports about each of the, the missions that they went to, to the different communities. Um, and they were sending the reports up to their, to the ministry level, to their supervisors. They were sharing the reports with, you know, the US embassy and other foreign embassies in the country. So I think that, I think that, it, it was well received. There were some skeptics at the beginning, um, but you know, to be honest with you, there is there's so much more work that needs to be done on this. Um, there, the the government governance is still not nearly as inclusive um, in in Central African Republic as it should be, and that's the case in many places. But there, there's a lot more there's a lot more work to be done. But I, I think when you give people the the opportunity to go out and and to engage and and to to talk to members of the community. I mean, they are almost always going to be touched or transformed in some way. And that was definitely the case in, in our work in CAR, although there is much that remains to be done. Well, at least USIP is there helping, you know, get things started. So, I mean, that's kind of another question that we got in the chat box. You know, I think we might have someone from Nigeria who's asking how, or he, she or she is asking, how can we engage you in, in Nigeria? I don't know if that's putting you on the spot too much, but. We have a great Nigeria program um, led by my colleague Oye Anabogu, and um, we, there's a, a page on USIP.org about USIP's Nigeria program. Um, Nigeria is one of the few places where we actually, not the few places, Nigeria is one of probably eight or ten places where we actually have a field office. So we have a team of I think four people out there working on programs in Nigeria. Um, including the, the Northern Governors Forum, um, which brings together governors from across Northern Nigeria to collaborate. Um, we also have a network of, of youth mediators. So we have a number of programs in Nigeria. Awesome, thank you. And Allison, I think, um, has put things in the chat box too. And I, I'm so sorry, I think we only have time for one more question, um, but I wanna end it with a, a Hawaii-related one. So. How can you know, Hawaii use its unique position in world culture for waging peace? That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think something um, is some sort of um, arts festival, some sort of statewide project, some sort of project that that PAC could put on. I mean, I feel that you're uniquely positioned to um, to embark on a project to address some of the the attacks on Asian Americans in this country. And I mean, that's not just in this country. So, I mean, this is this is maybe out of my lane, but I mean, I, I think that you could really be uniquely positioned to develop some sort of um, some sort of art or, or storytelling project or, or dialogue project, because you really are at a crossroads culturally in a way that that is, I think, unique even in the United States where we have so many states that are cultural crossroads. I mean, Hawaii is sort of the, the ultimate in that. So um, yeah, I'd encourage you to be creative and I'm, you know, I'm happy to brainstorm with you if you ever want to contact me. Yes, no, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And we hopefully will. I mean, thank you both of you and Allison for putting your, your email addresses and contact info in the, in the chat box. I mean, really um, hoping to 
the audience can still connect with you after this. Um, but I do need to wrap things up and just really thank you again for your time today, both you and Allison sharing so many um, insights and inspiring aspects of the role of art in Sudan and CAR. I mean, um, really blown away by the power of, of art and the people's motivation and it's very inspiring. Um, I just also wanna thank again, the United States Institute of Peace, the World Affairs Councils of America and all of our co-sponsors for joining us today. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I feel like we're wrapping it up so quickly, but um, your contact information again shared here. So thank you very much. And please take care of yourselves, everyone out there. Thank you for joining us and make art. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>